Hi, my name is Mary Neal. I am Director of Assistance to the Incarcerated Mentally Ill. That is something that I started. I started that online advocacy after my brother, Larry Morris Neal, was secretly arrested for 18 days in Memphis, Tennessee, and killed. Uh, that was the Shelby County Jail in Tennessee. Uh, while he was incarcerated, my family and his social worker looked for him as a missing person. Police ignored the missing person report and they continually said that they did not have him arrested, neither did they do anything to help us locate him. After 18 days, they came to the house and they said that he was dead. He was dead, but they would not say how he died. They would not say how he was killed, nothing. So we hired the Jenny Cochran firm as our wrongful death attorneys. We were not told that Julian Bolton, who was the manager of the Memphis Cochran firm, was himself a Shelby County Commissioner. And the Shelby County Commission owns and operates the jail where Larry Neal died. It was horrible. We went through that entire Tennessee statute of limitations, which is only a year in Tennessee. During that whole year, the Cochran firm pretended to be doing illegal work as our wrongful death attorneys. They were to interview other people who were incarcerated at the time my brother was. They were to demand records. Larry had been in a mental hospital for about 20 years. He had mumps when he was a child and the mumps, uh, the infection from his mumps went into his brain and he was never the same after that. He was about eight years old. He went into the mental hospital when he was nine years old and he stayed until he was in his mid-twenties. He would come home irregularly, uh, but he would never be able to behave himself enough to stay. He was a um, schizophrenic, a paranoid schizophrenic, and, but he was harmless. So Larry would sing outside, he'd, he'd do panhandling, he would do things that uh, would irritate police. Police would tell him to move on, don't come back here, but he would. He would go back to the same business locales and whatever, and he would sing loud and he would pan out, and they would arrest him. Over and over he was arrested for doing different things that were related to his mental illness. Until finally the police decided that they were sick of him, and they were sick of their roles as enforced caretakers. So Larry was arrested secretly. He was kept for 18 days and he was killed by some means that has never been released to us. This is nine years later. We've asked through uh, subpoenas, federal subpoenas. We've asked through the Freedom of Information Act. We cannot get any response. The Cochran firm defrauded us. And I found since then that the Cochran firm defrauds many of their clients in order to save government and uh, uh, entities and to save um, big corporations. Uh, of course, they do some cases right because if they did not, they would not have any parts of the reputation that they have. However, they are frauds. Johnny Cochran sold his firm uh, while he was yet living to some individuals and uh, they're using it now, his name, his reputation, to defraud minorities from coast to coast. You can look online and see some of the frauds. Most of them are not reported in the uh, media. They're only reported in legal journals, but they've been sued for fraud over and over by their clients, their attorneys, and their former attorneys. They're sued for fraud because they are frauds. In any case, they took our case, they held it, they did nothing that they promised, and then at the end of the uh, time, they had actually an empty file. We filed uh, a complaint with the Tennessee Bar, which did nothing. We filed uh, uh, a lawsuit against the Cochran firm when we found that they had let the time pass uh, to get a lawsuit together against the state of Tennessee, 
Larry was a ward of the state of Tennessee. We wanted to sue them for negligence after he died. We wanted to sue his former care home for negligence after he died. And we wanted to sue Shelby County Jail for wrongful death after he died. The Cochran firm was supposed to handle all three lawsuits and they had an empty file. They kept the case 10 and a half months of the 12 month statute of limitations and did zero. So when we found that out, it was too late to get another attorney to file three lawsuits within a few weeks. First of all, they would have had to get Larry's extensive uh, history from um, Tennessee where he had been a patient for 20 years as an inpatient. He had been an outpatient for another 20 years because he would go to the hospital whenever he had a crisis situation. They were supposed to get the medical records. They were supposed to have a, my mother, Hattie Neal, uh, declared his uh, beneficiary, and I was to be the administrator. Uh, they did none of that, none of that, empty file. So what happened is, that we sued the Johnny Cochran firm for their fraud right here in Atlanta, Georgia, in Georgia Superior Court. The case was assigned to Judge Wendy Schub. Judge Wendy Schub uh, decided with the Cochran firm that we couldn't sue the Johnny Cochran firm in Georgia at all because they don't have an office in Georgia. That was just unbelievable. They're on TV every few minutes. They were on uh, the martyr train every five minutes. They have billboards big as the world. They are in all the phone books. They're all over the internet. They're Atlanta office. But I have a court order saying that my lawsuit was dismissed because I tried to sue them having served the Atlanta office and they have no law firm in Atlanta, no law office in Atlanta. They answered the suit in the name Cochran, Cherry, Given, Smith, and Sistrick, uh, PC. The truth is that's a lie. That's an, that's a, an alias. PC means uh, professional corporation. Every professional corporation has to be registered with the Secretary of State's office, and there has never been, there had never been any entity by that name registered with the Secretary of State's office. So they sued in court under an alias, they answered our suit rather, under an alias that did not exist to deny their own existence in Georgia. Uh, it was, just, it was uh, just a kangaroo court, just the biggest mess. But we let them get away with that and did not appeal because we wanted to be in federal court anyway since uh, my brother died in Tennessee and we thought the federal court would be better for getting records from across state lines. And so we sued next in federal court. This was Judge Timothy Batten's court. And uh, when we sued there for their fraud, uh, the Johnny Cochran firm, uh, Timothy Batten said that uh, anything the Johnny Cochran firm did to defraud us is immaterial. That's what the court order reads. Whatever they did to us is immaterial. We can only take it that uh, people can treat you this way uh, and it's considered immaterial by your nation's courts because you're immaterial. We figure that Larry Neal was an immaterial man being black, being handicapped, and being poor. And we figure that we're immaterial people. And we figure that you're immaterial people. We figure if you're in the working class, no matter what race you are, you are an immaterial person. In fact, you're considered a nobody. That's what we think is happening. And, uh, and so I couldn't believe it. It was just outrageous. And all the while that we were working on this case, uh, we had cyber stalkers who were interfering with the pleadings I'd, I'd be working on a pleading and stop and do something else and come back to my computer and the pages were all awry on the pleading. And I said, my goodness, what is my computer doing? At that time, I didn't know that I had cyber stalkers who had been assigned to interfere with what I was typing. And, uh, and then people started following me home from work at night. I'd get off from work at night and there would be three and four cars following me home, three and four cars. 
The guards were afraid to walk me out of my, the law firm where I worked. They were afraid to walk me out of there to the car at night because sometimes people would drive right along beside of us going two miles an hour uh, to harass me because I was suing. I figured it was because I was suing the Cochran firm. There is nothing else, you know, dramatic that was standing out in my life. And so uh, my job offered me the opportunity to uh, transfer to a safe position because they were downsizing. I told them, no, thank you. And the reason I said no, thank you was because I had uh, the lawsuit going against the Cochran firm. I didn't see any way. Uh, this was when we were in federal court. I didn't see any way for them to get out of it. Uh, they undoubtedly had taken the lawsuit, had done absolutely nothing on it, took the lawsuit in an undisclosed uh, conflict of interest. And uh, so I just said, no, thank you because it was so scary to drive home at night with people following me all the way home. One night I wrote an email about it. I sent it to uh, uh, about 2,000 people on my Yahoo uh, email list. And uh, this lawyer, uh, her name is uh, Mason. Uh, she works for the Cochran firm, Angela Mason. Uh, she wrote the judge a pleading and asked uh, that he uh, tell me to stop saying that the Cochran firm hired a Caucasian man in a white truck to follow me. Now, I never said uh, it was a white truck. So, you know, this is uh, letting me know uh, exactly who's doing it. Uh, I never said what color the truck was, but she knew. So these are the types of things that were going on. Uh, it's been going on ever since, nine years. They take over my computer. Uh, I'm followed often when I go places. That recently seems to have stopped, and I'm very glad that it did. But uh, I used to be followed every place. In fact, for a year and a half, I stayed home. For a year and a half. I take films of uh, their computer takeovers. I'm a prisoner activist. I am um, interested in all prison issues, uh, especially the mentally ill. There are 1.25 million mentally ill people in prison. 1.25 million. As a matter of fact, they were released from mental hospitals uh, to enrich prison profiteers. Uh, when prisons went private, when they started privatizing prisons, they let all the mentally ill people pretty much out of prison. And it's very out of jail, rather, out of the mental hospital. And they put them in prison. Uh, that's where they are. They were, they were only free for uh, probably months because they were arrested for vagrancy and, and other things. And once they go to prison, it's very hard for them to get out because uh, they constantly do things that are against rules. And they get more and more time added to their sentence. And... I expected the cavalry to come when this, when this all happened. When a man uh, like Larry, a harmless, mentally ill man, 54 years old, was secretly arrested and murdered, murdered. They won't tell us how they did it and why they did it. And, uh, you know, it's a darn shame. That jail, Shelby County Jail, was under the, uh, it was already under lawsuit by the USA. The USA had already sued the jail for inmate abuse. And uh, they were to make... Uh, fatality reports, whenever somebody died, they were to uh, be under the overview of the USDOJ. That's the United States Department of Justice. When Larry died, it's like the USDOJ joined the program to help the jail get away with the murder. They, they, uh, it's, it's outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. They uh, will not answer my Freedom of Information Act request about Larry's murder. They won't tell me whether he was tasered to death, killed in a restraint chair, beaten to death, starved to death. We've had mentally ill people to be starved to death in a Utah jail this year. Let's see, yeah, February of 2012. A young man starved to death in a Utah jail. We've had all these things happen to people. As a matter of fact, uh, most police violence incidents uh, are with a mentally ill person. Most of the shootings, most of the taserings, most of these uh, beatings are a mentally ill person being the victim. And so, you know, we're, we're not getting any type of relief uh, for this. And I would like 
for you to please, number one, um, you know, usually the USDOJ recently um, uh, certified AOT programs, that's Assisted Outpatient Treatment Programs for the Mentally Ill, so that they could uh, uh, get enforced treatment. Now, why enforced treatment? Because uh, I understand that most people who are mentally ill or, or have uh, mental dysfunctions uh, don't need enforced treatment, you know. But uh, there are those people who cannot survive on their own in society without treatment. And there's a problem that they are too mentally ill, too out of touch with reality, to understand that they have mental problems. So, you know, it's ridiculous to ask a person who is dysfunctional to say that they're dysfunctional and they need help. That's ridiculous to wait for that. Uh, there was a time when a family could easily uh, have a person committed if they are mentally ill. And that's no longer the case because all the money, the money for hospitals has been diverted to jails. It's been diverted to building more jails that uh, municipalities sign a contract with the, the, the jail owners to keep them a certain amount, uh, keep the occupancy high, up to 90%. So, you know, it's almost as though uh, people want the mentally ill to be uh, without treatment, without care, so that they will do something to go to jail. And if they do something really bad, okay, like for instance, if they kill people, if they kill someone, then uh, they stay in jail longer. They stay in jail longer. So it's like the system is built around taking advantage of our most vulnerable people's disabilities. And that's real. We all saw uh, the Fullerton uh, County police officers there in California beat Kelly Thomas to death. We all saw that. So I want to know, what did you do to Larry Neal? Did you beat him? Did you starve him to death? Did you put him in a restraint chair like, uh, like you did uh, Sean, Sean LaVert? Like you did Tim Souders? You know, what is it that is happening to the mentally ill people in this nation? Why can't they have the protection, the right to life? What's wrong with us? Why we can't have the Constitution? Why is it that families of the mentally ill are, are pushed aside and not included in decisions for their loved ones? It is ridiculous. This is so mercenary. It's doggish. And so I wrote this poem called Dog Justice. And do I have time to read it? I'll read uh, Dog Justice because I am very, very censored. And uh, I mean, this poem is very censored. And it, and it shows the, the, the dilemma that we're in. Um, you know, Michael Vick had some dogs and he killed them. You know, he killed his dogs. And he went to jail for two years. He got bankrupt all the money that he had. He got fired from the Falcons. And my brother, a man, was secretly arrested for 18 days, murdered in Memphis Shelby County Jail, and nothing has happened. In fact, nobody's even had to answer a question about it. So I wrote Dog Justice. Too bad you weren't a dog, my brother. In my heart, I cried. Many more people would care about you and wonder why you died. You had no spots of floppy ears. You never fetched a ball. Instead, you were a human being, but poor, black, and flawed. You died in jail for mental illness. I know down in my heart. Your death would be investigated if only you could bark. Dog deaths get swift justice. Their abusers are sent to jail. Poor mama would have closure now if you'd had a wagging tail. But you were made in God's image. And someday, I have no doubt, the mentally ill and American dogs will have at least equal clout. We want equality to dogs for the mentally ill in the United States of America.